Hello, my name is Mary Ann Novi, and I'm a retired professor of English from the University of Pittsburgh, and I am an adoptee. This talk is about adoption education for nurses and patients. People with a family connection to adoption are a minority group that you may not hear much about, but nurses ought to learn something about their needs. Sometimes you may be able to educate patients about the needs of their adopted children or other patients about their own needs and something that might help them. I am an adoptee, same race, same nation, no orphanage time, so in a less difficult situation than most. But I have learned a lot from talking with and reading about other adoptees, as well as from a P Pittsburgh pediatrician, Sarah Springer, who specializes in working with children in adoptive families. At the end of this talk, I will suggest some books you might want to read for better understanding. Is adoption frequent? It's more visible now because more adoptees are transracial. A few years ago, about 44% of adopted kindergartners were being raised by parents of a different race or ethnic group. I felt adoption was rare when I was growing up, because it was such a secret, I didn't even know that one of my cousins was adopted. My parents told me not to talk about being adopted, and I obeyed them too long. But that must be one of the reasons why I talk about it so much now. A few years ago, the Adoption History Project website estimated that there were about 5 million adoptees in the United States, which would mean that about one out of every 66 people was adopted. For children under 18, it's about 1 out of 50. Over 1 million U.S. women relinquished children between 1945 and 1973. These women would probably be between 63 and 95 now, so maybe half of them are still living and might be among your patients. Since abortion was legalized, single mothers became eligible for welfare payments and pregnant women and girls stopped being automatically fired or expelled from school, the numbers have diminished. But still, every year, about 1% of U.S. women who bear a child relinquish the child for adoption. The U.S. Census of 2010, for the first time, asked a question about adoption, and the resulting estimate was that about 4% of families with children under 18 are adoptive families. Children come to adoption in various ways. At present, relatively few are adopted internationally. Most of them would be teenagers, since the number has continued to drop from its high of 23,000 a year in 2004. In 2019, there were only 3,000 international adoptions in the United States. About a third of adopted children were placed through voluntary domestic adoption, through a private agency or independent adoption. About a third of these might have special health care needs. Some children are adopted by step-parents. A larger number of children were removed from birth parents who were judged to have abused or neglected them, placed in the foster care system, and then adopted. By far, more children continue to live in the less permanent arrangements of foster care and kinship care. About 4% of U.S. children under 18 are living with relatives in kinship care. Children placed with relatives make up about a quarter of all children in the foster care system, and about 25 times as many are being raised by relatives outside the system. These last children are mostly living in poverty, and half of them have a caregiver with a significant mental health impairment. These estimates are astounding and ominous for our future. Most adoptees are much better off, but in some ways adoption may be a lifelong health issue even for many of those well cared for by their parents, because they are still in closed adoptions. Even as adults, they cannot see their birth certificates to learn their original names and the names of their original parents, and know nothing about their medical history. Adoption agencies have usually failed to pass on information, especially health updates that birth parents may provide. Many children who were adopted from an orphanage or from foster care have experienced trauma or neglect. Some children, like me, were cared for lovingly and for a brief period of time before they were adopted. And others are resilient and have overcome the early instability they experienced. But even they have a slightly different experience in life 
if they don't look like their parents and don't know their family medical history. I found out half of mine when I met my birth mother in my mid-30s. She was glad to see me, though we were very different in our interests and life experiences. I found that she had anemia and osteoporosis and a tendency to depression. I had had times of anemia and depression also, and have kept my osteopenia from getting worse by exercise and diet. She had macular degeneration. I take vitamins that are supposed to prevent this. I found it reassuring to know that she didn't have heart problems and there wasn't breast cancer in the family, though her father died of leukemia. We were very different and lived an eight-hour drive apart. A few years after I was adopted, she had married and had seven sons, two of them at home when I met her, most of them living in the same state and regularly in touch. I generally visited her about once a year. She lived to be 91, and last saw most of the family when the daughter of one of her sons got married, but I hear from several of my brothers regularly on Facebook. Adoptees' childhoods after adoption vary widely. Few adoption agencies require much counseling or education. Some parents find the guidance they need or have developed understanding from their own experience and empathy. However, some would benefit from informed counseling, which some agencies do provide. If you live in or near Cleveland, for example, you can get help from Adoption Network Cleveland, which has many kinds of support services. Pittsburgh's Three Rivers Adoption Council has a few. Adoptive parents should know that they should tell their children about adoption at an early age. That is, first when they are toddlers, in a way that fits their level of understanding, shows that it can be discussed, and gives them feelings of comfort and of being loved. There are books for even that age that deal with parent-child difference in appearance. For example, A Mother for Choco, or I Don't Have Your Eyes. If you work with a pediatrician, family practitioner, or someone else who sees a lot of children, you could put some books like these in the waiting room. Parents who have transracially adapted need to learn about racially related mental and physical health needs. Their children need to see people who look like them in books, pictures, dolls, action figures, and in real life. Adults of all races would like to see themselves represented in magazines in the waiting room also. Unmarried pregnant women are not ordinarily given sympathetic guidance when considering adoption. Agencies actually understate the mental pain that birth mothers will feel for years. However, women who trust their children to adoptive parents in an open arrangement ultimately do better than those in closed adoption, assuming the adoptive parents maintain the agreement. Better, however, does not mean that there is no feeling of loss. Both of the organizations I mentioned have support groups for birth parents, and you can also find Concerned United Birth Parents online. Adult adoptees may use the state's adoption registry if they know which state they were born in, or they may be able to use DNA testing to find birth relatives and medical information. We adoptees have unrestricted access to our original birth certificate in eight states, no legal access in 17, and partial access depending mostly on birth mother's consent in the rest. There may be occasions when medical reasons would persuade a judge to open records. The language you use in talking with patients and adoptive families is important. As many of you, of course, already know, it is disrespectful to adoptive families to refer to adoptive adoptees, birth parents, or first parents as their real parents, as opposed to their adoptive parents. Look in a dictionary with regard to parent or mother or father, and you will find the words are defined both with regard to biology and with regard to care. Similarly, it is hurtful to, repeal, to refer to children born to their parents as their parents' real children or own children, as contrasted with their adopted children, as, for example, to use the term real sister or real brother, only about children born to the same mother. An adopted child's biological family should not be considered their only real family. If someone calls my birth mother my real mother, I would object because my adoptive mother was just as real. I usually just called her my mother and wouldn't have liked a nurse or doctor referring to her as my adoptive mother unless we were talking about heredity. Adoptive parents understandably feel adoption is a great achievement. Many children in foster care and orphanages look forward to being adopted, but some in foster care would rather return to their birth parents. Every adoption means that birth parents, if alive, have been in difficulties. 
Many feel the loss of their child deeply for years, and adopted children and foster children, even in a loving family, may feel the loss of a history and ancestry, someone whose appearance might indicate what they would look like as an adult. An increasing number of children are now in an open adoption. Currently, 95% of agencies allow some degree of openness when children are adopted. This may mean only that one or both of their birth parents met and, and chose their adoptive parents, but it may mean something more. For example, that they see their birth mother and siblings several times a year or perhaps even more often. You may be surprised if a child mentions this, since it is so much outside what has been expected in adoption, and may think the child is not telling the truth, but it is an increasing trend. If a relationship with the birth family is maintained, health information is available, children don't have to make up fantasies about their ancestry, and ideally, children know they have more people who love them. Psychologists find that often the child is happier if this relationship can begin when young and continue, just as might a relationship with an old family friend. and needs to be no threat to the adoptive family. Such a relationship can also happen in assisted reproduction, with a surrogate mother or an egg or sperm donor, though it is probably less common. But it has been estimated that about 10,000 babies in the U.S. are born from egg donation per year, and at least 25,000 from sperm donation. The Center for Disease Control estimates that 1.6% of the children born in the U.S. in the most recent years were conceived with some kind of assisted reproduction, including surrogacy. There are now books available to explain this to children. Some can be found on tapestry.com. Most children with such an origin have some genetic link to one or both of their parents and don't have the experience of moving from one home to another, so some of this talk is not relevant to them. Especially if they are in a gay or one-parent-headed family, however, they may still need reassurance that different kinds of families are welcome and okay. I promised some reading suggestions at the end. If you like memoirs, one of the best for understanding transracial adoption is Nicole Chung's All You Can Never Know by a woman adopted from Korean immigrants to the United States. I also recommend Lucky Girl by Mei Ling Hopgood for a picture of the childhood of an adoptee from China who was very close to her American parents. A book that shows the difficulties of an African-American adoptee and a white family is Black Baby, White Hands, by Jaya John. For the viewpoint of an adoptive parent of a child with disabilities, see Reasonable People by Ralph Savarisi, whose son is never able to speak but learns electronic facilitated communication and has graduated from college with honors. If you were looking for a book about birth mothers or by a birth mother, uh, one uh, would be Lorraine Dusky's book, Hole in My Heart. Her experience was really terrible. A better one in terms of the experience that the uh, uh, that the birth mother experienced in some ways uh, is Waiting to Forget by Margaret Moorman, but she never does actually meet her son, although she does get a letter from him. In a year or two, you will be able to see my book about adoption memoirs and learn which of almost over 40 I discussed you would like to read. A book with insight into people with many different relations to adoption is The Family of Adoption by Joyce McGuire Pavo, a social worker who lectures at the Harvard Medical School. Another book to recommend to parents is Telling the Truth to Your Adopted or Foster Child by Betsy Kiefer and, and Joyce E. Schooler. And for physical as well as behavioral issues in children, Adoption Medicine, headed by Patrick Mason, Dana Johnson, and Lisa Prock published by the American Academy of Pediatrics, would be very helpful. You can reach me at mnovi at pit.edu for communication later. But right now, what questions do you have?